All right, so I'm really, really happy to sit and talk with Josh now. Um, I'll give a little backstory on this. I had met Josh, and we had spent you know, a day and a half, two days together at a conference. We had a chance to really talk, and I was just so impressed with him, his worldview, both as a business person, as a marketer, also just like as a human from a philanthropic point of view. And I kind of uh, decided like either to like figure out what's up or call bullshit. And uh, I flew out to see him like two weeks later. It was just like, hey, you know, even though you're, you're so many years younger than I am, you know, I, I really want you to uh, help me and, and, and mentor me some with my career. So now to uh, be able to have him at the Geek Out event is uh, very meaningful to me and I'm very excited to sit and uh, talk with you today, Mr. Josh. Yeah, it's really my pleasure and welcome to my home. It really is, uh, it really feels good to have great people around. Thanks, man. All right, so uh, let's go back as far as your career and, and how everything started. When did you even first learn what click-through rate was? You know, I, I love this Geek Out event because I truly am a geek's geek. So I started about uh, 10, 11 years ago as a programmer. And what, as geek as it gets. As geek as it gets. And what really got me into that, so it was kind of off character for me because I was, uh, I'm a taller guy. I, was, uh, I always joke around. I was six feet by 10 years old and I kind of stopped growing after that. But uh, that led me into a lot of sports. So um, I was uh, playing varsity football freshman year of my high school. And this was when um, the economy wasn't doing too well. Okay. And, uh, and uh, I found out that um, we were going through kind of a rough patch financially as a family. And I wanted to figure out a way to help my family out. And at the time, I was going to the Phoenix Public Library, so a library locally here, um, mainly to avoid some of the uh, some of the gang-related activities. So a lot of the uh, uh, things that weren't too um, uh, too nice going around in my neighborhood, and and I wanted to avoid that. My parents wanted me to keep me away from that. And while I was at the library, there was a competition where uh, you could read a book, take a test, and you got points, and you could cash these points in for all sorts of stuff. And one of the, well, one of the hacks that I found uh, while doing that, I was, I was 14 at the time, 14 years old, was that if you read reference books, so the boring books, you would get a lot more points. And one of those uh, series of books was the For Dummies book. And I picked up uh, how to build a website for dummies, how to program for dummies. Got it. And I was just reading through those and eventually I came to the point where I said, this stuff seems realistic. I might actually be able to do this. Uh, and still at the time I had no idea that you could actually make money doing it. I just thought it was really cool. Um, and programming and websites weren't as cool back then. So I didn't want to tell any of my football buddies or anyone else what sure. I was doing. But anyway, that's what, that's what got me into it and I clicked your rate um, kind of came a couple, uh, maybe a year or two later when I was approached by my first advertiser on one of my websites that I ran anonymously. I didn't want anyone to know who I was, that I was under 18, whatever. And I received an email and they were asking to advertise on my website. Sure. And I had no idea what that meant. So of course I went, I typed into Google, what does that mean? And slowly but surely I started to learn about that they wanted a banner on my website to promote uh, their company and they were looking at a click-through rate. So how many out of 100 eyeballs were looked at it, how many click through? And so I learned that if I could put them in a prominent position, they would get a lot of clicks and they'd want to advertise more and more with me, which meant that I could eventually save enough money to buy my own computer, and then I didn't have to go to the library to use a computer, I could You're do it at home. You were still doing this from the library with their computer. I had one hour, um, they'd give you one hour a day to use the computer. And uh, people that would go in, regulars that would go in, they got to know this kid who was always there, which was me. And they would say, hey Josh, I'm just gonna check my email really quickly and then you can use the computer. <laughs> and so I started kind of stacking time. So I would have a few hours sometimes to use the computer. But every time I logged out, um, it would essentially erase everything. And the cloud wasn't back then, you know, Dropbox wasn't a thing. So I had to essentially start over every time, every hour that I, I signed in. But I was so hungry. To, to, to figure this out. And as soon as I realized I could make a few hundred bucks and I could help my family, I was hooked. Wow, this is uh, it's a crazy story. Like starting from that way, from, from having to really grind through it and to help your family, it's such a solid way to uh, grow. And obviously you've been like blessed because of it. You know, the, the building websites, 
That that led into what first part of your business? Like you're you've come up so quick that I need you to give me like a pretty detailed timeline, right? So it went from being at the library, learning how to build websites to what to what, you know, to, to where we're here. So yeah, it's a good question. I, um, it's fun sometimes to revisit that because it. I think when you're in the weeds, uh, it seems so frustrating. I remember thinking, gosh, if I could make a thousand dollars a month, then I wouldn't have to work while I'm in high school and, and I could help my family out. I remember being able to buy, first it was save enough money to buy a computer. And my first desk was, um, my mom had these clothing bins, uh, plastic clothing bins, and I flipped them over. And I couldn't afford the monitor and the PC at the same time, so I had to buy one by one. And I flipped them over, I flipped over a trash, trash bin, and I used it for my mouse. And I, I split the internet uh, bills with my dad. And um, his only thing was, as long as I kept my grades up in school, I could continue to do whatever I wanted on the internet. Um, he really, um, he's from Spain, immigrant, left a really good career in Spain. And he wanted me to uh, pursue um, a degree in medicine or something a lot more stable. And I didn't know I was an entrepreneur. I, I didn't know what's going on. I just wanted to help my family out. And so that hunger to help um, really led the, it fed the intellectual curiosity and I became ravenous in consuming anything I could online. So I was always on um, Google, YouTube, um, even back in the day watching tutorials and then of course a lot of books. And so I learned how to program. Then um, I had to learn how to design because I needed to actually design the websites themselves. And then teachers started to find out at my school that I knew how to make websites. So they would say, oh, my friend so-and-so has a cupcake shop and she sure. needs a website. Sure. How much do you charge for that? And I remember going to Google and typing in, you know, how much do people charge for this? Uh, actually, I, I might have even went to Ask Jeeves um, back in the day and I asked Jeeves, what do you charge for a website? Sure. And so I remember, um, I think it was like $500 a charge and she was like, oh, that's great. Okay, I'll let her know. How long is it gonna take? A few months, you know, whatever. And I said, oh, I could do it this weekend. And uh, she was like, wow, okay, um, well, go ahead and, and go for it. So I remember I went home, figured it all out. So as uh, th that started kind of the client kind of service agency sure. route that I didn't even know I was doing at the time. So as clients started to ask for certain features, I had to learn how to program in CSS, JavaScript, PHP, MySQL, whatever had to be done, I just had to figure out how to do it. Because I knew if I, didn't, if I could figure out how to do it, they would pay me and I could help my family out. And I remember even just buying my own socks and underwear for myself and being able to feel that financial independence at that scale was really, really freeing and empowering. And so that led into, um, I had a client one day come to me and say, Josh, the website you built is phenomenal, but it's not getting sales. Right. And I said, I, said, I don't know what to tell you. I, I don't know. I, I, I program, I design, I don't know. And he said, uh, if you learn how to do that, I would pay you every month instead right. of just one time. And again, I said, wow, I could really use that. I need a car. I'm taking the city bus everywhere. And Arizona, where, where I live and where I grew up, it's not a very uh, public transportation uh, focused uh, sure. city. So for me taking the city bus, I'd have to wake up at 5 a.m. I, um, I had to go for football practice and student government that I was involved in early in the morning. And, uh, and then after school, after practice and all of that, I would have to go home, do my homework, I had to keep straight A's, um, and I had to build websites and all of that. So I was constantly working, and I didn't tell anybody because it wasn't a cool thing to talk about back then. And really, I didn't know what I was doing. So one thing led to the other, and I started to learn about sales, marketing, advertising, and I did what I always did back then and what I knew, went back to the library, read everything I could about, right. about that. And I got lucky because one of, the, one of the authors I learned from, Dr. Robert Cialdini, happened to be local at Arizona State University and I ended up um, learning uh, a lot from, from him. And so I read everything I could. This was at, I was 16 years old. He's amazing, by the way. His Phenomenal. book, like, honestly, Persuasion. Oh. It, it, or, I'm sorry, Influence. Influence. It's uh, just so amazing the way he captured what we do as marketers. I can't, I can't believe you had that opportunity. It's fantastic. Well, I was actually training, I was training at the gym um, uh, freshman year of college, and I had the opportunity to um, train right next to him and his wife, and both 
phenomenal people. And I remember him mentioning one time, he's, he was so fascinated with what I was doing, but I was so, um, I, I admired everything he had done. And so he mentioned something about that, that he can't, he wouldn't do what I do, it's, which is put it into practice. Yes. And so he's at the highest levels of understanding of, of all those principles. And I get to read a book and get the distillation of all those learnings and apply them in my business sure. and make money from them. Sure. And so um, I started to learn about sales, marketing. Uh, and naturally by getting more and more clients who needed websites, um, I, I, I had to build a team. And because I was in high school, 16 years old, I couldn't have an office. Um, that wasn't even a thought. And so I remember I, found, I stumbled into a website called SitePoint. And on SitePoint, you could sell websites on there. So I started to sell a couple of my own websites to make a few hundred bucks, a few thousand bucks, bought my first car, and uh, I got an email one day or message on there that said, hey, you're really good at selling websites, could you sell mine? Wow. And I was like, oh, and I'm anonymous, you know, anonymous username, no one knew who I was. And uh, I said, sure. And so I became kind of a broker without even knowing it, just helping other people. But the best um, uh, blessing that came from that was that I got to see the back end of some guys making millions of dollars and they were single man shops and they used what were called freelancers. And I had never heard of that term. Wow. And so I said, I could do this too. And, uh, and so I started to hire freelancers all over the world. And so while I was in high school, I was managing teams, um, you know, dozen, two dozen people at a time um, as, I, as I started to expand that business. So from there, I learned how to design, program, write copy, sell over the phone and I remember I used to deepen my voice and in between classes I'd be closing deals and all the kids would be running by and it'd be really loud and I'd say oh busy day at the office and uh, in reality I was at school in between the class you this know, is crazy these deals man. and uh, I just knew that I had to help my family out I knew that um, I was obsessed at that point I had uh, I ended up giving up football which was very very hard for me sports track and field I gave up a lot of things that I really enjoyed in my life because I found something that consumed me. And I think a lot of us, when we first kind of dive into that foray of internet marketing and entrepreneurship, we become obsessed. And you start to read about other entrepreneurs. And one thing, I'm always looking for patterns. And what I found is that a lot of the self-made uh, uh, entrepreneurs, billionaires, millionaires, whatever, um, had similar traits of grit, perseverance, coming from adversity and using that to their advantage. And I connected a lot with those, with those people. And uh, I started to realize that I was an entrepreneur and I had I'd stumbled into it. And then I got really embarrassed when I realized it because I didn't know how I was gonna tell my parents that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. Yeah, wait, th this is something that <clears throat> I didn't wanna interrupt you, but I wanted to understand about this. So while you're doing this, you're running a remote team of freelancers, you're doing this at school on the low. Do your parents at this point know anything that you're doing? The, the most that they know is I printed out, um, this is back when I was still in the library, I printed out that email with someone to advertise and I showed it you know, to my parents and they're like, be careful, a lot of scams. I have a friend that you know, won a free iPad, or free, one well, was an iPad back then, but won a free whatever, 100 bucks and it turned out to be a scam. Sure. So they were terrified, and rightfully so. They were, they were doing their job and then I remember um, kind of, uh, <laughs> in a way, tricking my dad to create a PayPal account. Because I went to Google and I was like, how do you get money online? And I found PayPal. And uh, I remember he was doing some type of home repair project. And I was like, oh, I found the part on eBay and it's a lot cheaper. But in order to get it, we need a PayPal account. So I remember um, tricking him into signing that up. Then I sent over the PayPal details to this company to send the money. I print the PayPal balance sheet out. And I remember paying 15 cents, it was a black and white paper. Showed it to my dad, he said, those are just numbers on a screen, be careful. And finally, even to transferring it to his Wells Fargo bank account, still like, don't touch it, it could go away. And so it was, they were, they were doing their job of protecting me from things that could happen. And I did, you know. Do they know what you do now? If, they, if, if I had to ask them, hey, what does Josh do? What would they say? I think so. I think that um, they've grown to, um, I think, marvel at the ability of being able to run a business in this day and age. The, the fact that I can um, 
I can, I can spend my time how I please, but still sure. be able to grow a business. I think they're amazed by that. I think that they understand we sell products and services online. Um, obviously, intricate details around SEO and algorithms. Sure. Um, I, I don't think so. Um, my, my mom is much more creative. She is much where I get the design side from things, fashion, design. Um, she was really into hair and styling. And my dad is um, uh, a skeptic, which is really good because I had a balance and very mathematical focus, logical. And so it was a good mix between the two. And I think my mom is someone who is just like, you can do anything. Sure, sure. you're going to the moon? Cool, you need, a, I'll pack a snack lunch for you. My dad's more like, well, the trajectory and the speed you need to go at to hit the moon is not really logical and you should not, you know, so it was a good balance. So now I think they understand holistically um, what I do. The fact that your mom is the optimist and your dad has the rational analysis, because the question I had for you, but I think it's really relevant here is, you're a super optimistic guy. You even said you're super optimistic. Yes. M myself also, like I think at a certain level, to, to be a successful entrepreneur, you really need to dream, but you dream really strong. Do you ever do anything to, to protect yourself from your optimism and your decision making? Like, are, are you ever concerned, like, maybe just overly optimistic? Like, what do you do to, to, to guard yourself from this? Or do you have insurance against yourself? So, I do, yeah. Um, I have, um, first and foremost, I have a great uh, a life partner, my girlfriend, who is a really good counterbalance for me in life because she studied accounting in college, uh, much more by the numbers, um, much more frugal, and she's a great uh, sounding board for me when I come home to vent or I'm in the process of making a big decision and I don't know if, it, if it's right or not. I'm one of those that I like to, to fire, fire, then ready, aim, figure the yes. ready, aim stuff out later. It doesn't yeah. excite me. The firing is what excites me. And so I have to balance that, but I've done, I think you get better over time. You kind of build intuition and intuition is the highest form of intelligence in my opinion. And I think that the more that you read, the more that you talk to, um, intelligent people in all various walks of life. So I have a lot of mentors who are um, in their 70s and 80s who are very successful. And going to them and, and uh, not asking them for money or not asking them, just really just their, their advice. And so for me, my sounding board is I'm very introspective. So anytime I'm gonna make a decision, I'm really thinking about how do I weigh the risk and reward? But I think as an entrepreneur, it's your job to take those big risks and you have to build that intuition. The only way you build that intuition is either through your experience and or through others' experience. So that's why I'm always watching documentaries, I'm reading autobiographies, I'm trying to learn the mistakes that other people made so that I don't have to make that, the same exact mistakes. Man, this, this I, I was speaking to someone today after we had chatted about just because of your age, right, and the amount of wisdom that you have, uh, both in business and obviously with person, you know, you have depth, you know, it was like I was trying to understand how you were able to acquire the data so quickly. Like, there's, life experience requires time, so you, you have to actually spend some time to buy some data, just like media buying. Yes. It, is the books and stuff like this, you talk about this a lot, how much do you read and do you feel like this is your accelerator, why you've been able to achieve so much so fast? I think that um, a couple things contribute uh, significantly to that. I think. Uh, what I do is, I, my favorite thing to do nowadays is uh, I get the audible audiobook version of the book, I put it on two times speed, and I get the hardcover version, and I use my pen or my finger, and I go along, and I can you know, tear through books in a few hours, uh, and I'm stopping along the way, and I usually have a blank sheet of paper to the right of me, I put the title of the book, and I'm putting things in there that I'm learning, and then I make a to-do list of things I want to apply to nice. one of my businesses. So I tear through you know, one or two books a week. Um, it's not hard to do when you do 30 minutes a day, 45 minutes a day. Um, generally business books, unless it's a really thick, like Tony Robbins money book or something really technical, those are harder to tear through. But um, I read a lot. I listen to maybe a couple dozen podcasts. So as I'm driving around, uh, I have podcasts on two times speed. I've trained my brain to accept two times speed as the average. Sure. That helps me tear through a lot more. And then really talking to, um, talking to people uh, that are relevant to the situation and getting their take on it. I love to find people who, um, who disagree with me. I've always been this way because I'm generally curious on how people think. And so I try to kind of, I'm like a, a metamorphosis in, in the mind 
uh, kind of like Play-Doh, is like, how do I need to shape my brain to see sure. this in a different way? So I'm very introspective. So I think that uh, being able to acquire a lot of data, you know, you're getting all these inputs, but how you, I look at it like software, you can acquire all this big data, but uh, how, how you process, filter, and use that data is much more important than the data itself in many ways. You wanna have integrity in your data, so you wanna make sure you're reading the right books. Yeah. You're reading, fall, make sure, one, one tip I give to, um, uh, we run a foundation for high school students who come from similar backgrounds as ours, who are underserved, economically disadvantaged, but that have entrepreneurial spirit, and they're ambitious, um, and they wanna be something in life. And one of the tips I give them is be very careful who you admire and who you follow. At any given moment, we're maybe following five people at the top of our mind. And it could be people you've never met, you'll never meet, people that have passed away, Steve Jobs, for example. Be very careful who you follow because you'll start to mimic the way they talk, the way they act, the, 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 the businesses that they're in. Um, and so I'm very, very mindful of who I follow and I, I kind of detox that once a year to make sure that who I'm following locally, spiritually, all of that is in line with where I want to be. And uh, ultimately that's, that's helped me take the data that I'm taking in. And the other thing is, the last thing I'll mention about this is just in time data. So just like you have just in time inventory, it comes right in time and it goes right out. I try to utilize just in time uh, data and information. What do you mean by that? So for example, you know, um, right now, I'm really, really focused on um, building my team and my various teams in the companies. And so I've been reading a lot about um, uh, leadership and okay. servant leadership. And so right now it's just in time because it's very relevant and I'm applying it right away. And if you can apply it and teach it, then you've understood it. And so as opposed to reading like Shakespeare, which you can do for fun, I may not apply that stuff for 20 years from now or so, and I think that creates a lot of anxiety because you read a book like Zero to One by Peter Thiel, which is a great book, and all of a sudden you're like, these offers I'm running, how am I changing the world? Is this really? Yeah, this was too hardcore. Like, it's, too look, hardcore. it's amazing, right? But what a jump on that one. Like really, that, that, that's hardcore. It's, it's not, or at least at that time in, in my development as a business, business man, it just wasn't relevant, you know? And that relevant info is uh, super important. Right. Oh, look who decided to show up. Hey, cutie. How's it going? <laughs> Gonna hang out with us? What a cutie. <laughs> Let's fast forward a little bit here. I know that you had got into the agency side and you had right. exited on that, no? Yes. So talk to me a little bit about that. When you first like crystallized like a real business, now, you already obviously had a real business. Sure. But uh, how long was it till you got past the freelancer level and just nailed the thing down and then, and then exited? Well, I stumbled into... Um, so I stumbled into Google AdSense because I was like, oh, I love having these advertisers, but um, there were far and few in between that would come to me directly. So I was like, how do I get more advertisers? And I found Google AdSense. So I was always running my own websites on the side while we were building stuff for clients. And so through AdSense, um, I found affiliate um, marketing because I was curious of who was advertising on the blog. And of course I was clicking my own ads like we all do and then um, got in trouble for that, didn't really mean anything by it, but I was trying to see who was advertising on the site. And so I'm like, how are these people making money? If they could afford to advertise on my site, they're clearly making money somehow. And uh, this was when Google wasn't as strict on um, you know, affiliate marketing and all that. And so I remember applying uh, with, <laughs> with my dad's information to some of these affiliate networks, because I wasn't 18. And uh, I started to apply a lot of what I was learning about search engine optimization, so SEO, um, uh, Google AdWords, anything I was learning, I could immediately apply on my own websites and then I could advertise for these affiliate offers. So that started to do really well, particularly on YouTube. Um, I've always been obsessed with, with data and algorithms and numbers. And so uh, the YouTube algorithm was something that was really interesting to me because I was learning a lot through YouTube as a consumer, and right. so I kind of figured out if I could create better videos um, on diets, lifestyles, I could plug the affiliate links right into the description. And so I started to do that. And then- um, and what like, year was this? This was 2009, maybe. Okay. Uh, 2008, 2009. And so then I was like, how do I fast track my way to getting, um, getting more views, getting more sales, more clicks? And so I started reaching out to some of the videos that had a lot of views uh, and, and asking if I could place my link in their description. And so that was a trackable 
um, uh, affiliate link. So now I was leeching off of all the videos wow. and paying them either one time through PayPal, a piece of cut of the commission. And so before I knew it, I had this huge network of YouTube videos. So like super early influencer, basically. Very early, yeah. And I, I really, honestly, all I knew was I put these videos out, they get lots of views, I get sales. How do I get more views? I could create more videos, but I could also leech off of these people. That was it, it was just literally, YouTube ads platform wasn't around, it was literally just, just that. And uh, so that kind, of, that kind of was a way for an outlet for me to practice what I wanted to practice without hurting like a client's account or anything like that. So after a while, I realized that why clients, and we started to charge you know, $20,000, $30,000 for a website. Uh, I went to um, uh, university and continued to run the business there in my dorm room. Uh, had about 30, 40 uh, full-time freelancers doing development, design, SEO, link building, wow. all of that. What were you studying? I was studying computer information systems at the business school um, at Arizona State University and I was also part of the Honors College. And so I kept that deal with my parents that as long as I kept my grades up, I could do whatever I wanted um, in, in the entrepreneurship uh, arena. So I ended up graduating valedictorian from high school, so number one in my class there. And then I've always tried to challenge myself um, in, in every way, shape, and form in sports. I'm very internally competitive um, and, and not so much externally competitive. So I'm not necessarily trying to push other people down. I'm trying to push myself to the limit. So um, in college, I was taking um, about double the course load as everybody else. And my challenge was, could I keep straight A's, run a, a successful business from my dorm room off of freelancers and still be involved and in just really pushing myself. And so I ended up graduating in two years. So when I was 20 years old, um, I finished uh, university as first in my family to graduate college. Wow. Um, also the youngest in my family, so that was really important to me. And so uh, once I graduated, I no longer had anything holding me back from working 18 hours a day. And so what I realized at that point, I had been doing this for from 14 years old, 13, 14 years old to 20. So I had six, seven years of solid experience. And I realized why clients kept coming to us. And it was because of our ability to uh, spend money very, very efficiently um, through advertising platforms. And so I, I pivoted our business away from doing big web development projects and software and all of that, more into managing budgets. And once we did that pivot, I built a tool that allowed uh, other agencies to plug in their client information and uh, essentially media plan for them based on the different platforms. And it also allowed the clients to audit what their agencies were doing. So this was kind of a Trojan horse because um, it became really popular amongst uh, PR agencies and traditional media companies, but when they realized that clients had transparency into what they were doing, they didn't like that that much because a lot of that business is, for lack of a better word, it's a song and dance, vanity metrics, and I was looking at ROI, true ROI. And so clients started coming directly to us or these big PR companies wanted to work directly with us. So we started getting contracts with Ford, Nabisco, Kraft, big very name. large, big names. And uh, I was really excited by that, but uh, it also was a bit radical in the sense that anytime we got a big contract, we had to hire a bunch of people. And once I got out of college, I could have an actual office. So we went, we got the most expensive office suite in Arizona, filled it with people, uh, still had our freelancers uh, offshore, and focused on managing, managing money, essentially managing budgets. And the best thing was it reminded me of my broker days when I kind of just happened to stumble into helping people sell their websites. I was now helping people spend millions of dollars uh, to drive sales, coupons, downloads, all of that. So at the height, we're managing over 100 million a year US dollars in advertising directly under my fingertips. So I was traveling a lot and I, had, uh, I went from playing football, being super athletic, to working 18 hours a day, seven days a week, managing you know, 30 plus people in the office, you know, 50 offshore, and it was all on my back, and I had a great team. I'm not, I'm not taking anything away from that. But at the end of the day, as an entrepreneur, it's your responsibility to keep the business growing overall. And so I had gained uh, about 100 pounds. Uh, I had you know, exotic cars. I was living the life, but I wasn't happy. I was, I was starting to feel burnt out, and so, um, we transitioned from, from building websites, development design, 
to managing budgets and doing a lot of SEO, multi-million dollar SEO uh, um, budgets to more of an algorithmic platform, kind of like what's uh, Ad Espresso's out now, there's a couple of those. We had like a very customized version of that that plugged into big PR agencies. Okay. So anyway, long story short, I, I, um, I realized one day that my team was having a lot more fun working on our side projects than they were working with the clients and under that stress. I also kind of lost a little bit of respect for the way that those big companies spent money. They spent it very branding focused and that was something that I wasn't comfortable with. Coming from starting with a hundred bucks, if I didn't make 150 back, I was out of business. For them, it was like spend it, just get rid of the money and they make their fee regardless. So I started approaching some of our bigger clients that we've integrated with and said, what would it look like if you brought this tool in house? You brought the spend in us, all the data we've acquired. So I started to massage that conversation. And six months later, I, I had to change the identity of our business from a service business, which is almost impossible to sell, to more of a platform and software play, which is a lot easier to sell, with the service layered on top. And Got so it. I learned a lot about spinning up and how you position a company so that it becomes attractive to someone who wants to buy it. And so I sold that company um, about four years ago now, uh, three and a half, four years ago. And since then, we've been 100% focused on stuff we own, operate, and do in-house. And we've got a few things that we do um, as a value add. Um, you know, in our financial services stuff, we have um, a very tight publisher network specifically for the few verticals we're in ourselves. But other than that, we don't have very many service uh, side things anymore. Uh, but without that, without that learning experience, without learning from a hundred million dollars a year of other people's money to learn from and getting paid to learn that, um, I figured out patterns again and figured out what worked, what didn't and realized I could take all of that and apply it to our own brands and build something that I could run for 50 years and, and, and do whatever I wanted to do with. Let's talk about that now, like brands. You have a lead gen side with your own offers, which is, uh, you know, brand in the lead gen world. You also have e-com brands. Tell me a little bit about that, what you have going on, how, how your time is split between these different type of projects. So every, um, every business we have now has been a result of us trying to solve a problem or, or a personal fascination. So for example, uh, we have an oral care brand called Snow. And Snow is one of our fastest e-commerce brands. Um, we've got five patents coming out with our new version in a few months. Let me explain too. Sure. It's, it's the tooth whitening. I mean, you've seen this ad a ton on Instagram and, and everywhere else. It's like the UV flowing, heavily LED, influenced, yep. Yep. yeah, LED teeth whitening system. So you know exactly which one this is. Who are some of the influencers you've had on this one? So um, we're doing a deal right now with uh, Floyd Mayweather. That's um, the one. Uh, you know, we had um, Chris Pratt with Jurassic Park post the other day. Um, actually, Rob Gronkowski from the New England Patriots and Chuck Liddell from the UFC, both are my business partners, so they own equity in that business with me. Okay. Um, and so, uh, it's been exciting. That's, that brand has done really well because of the uniqueness of our formula. So our, our formula, uh, we started off as really a teeth whitening company and now transitioning into an oral care uh, uh, company. Um, really coming out with our own patents, our own designs, toothpaste. Uh, we're working on a special line with, with Floyd Mayweather, you know, talking about you know, putting gold, uh, gold flakes in our mouthwash and um, using 24 karat gold on our mouthpiece and all this that stuff. This will sell, this is so marketable. It, and he's so yeah. marketable, this is sweet. Oh yeah, well he's got a great smile. I mean, he's undefeated. And uh, he actually reached out to us and uh, came across our Instagram page and they were looking for, Conor McGregor is working, uh, was working with a competitor of ours based in Australia, and uh, Floyd thought their branding and all of that was kind of cheap, and their product was cheap, and wanted to do something, but wanted it to be like the Nordstrom, the high-end version. So he came across our feed, um, realized that we're the real deal, and, and came up with his manager, who's phenomenal, came up with some different angles, and it just made sense. And so um, that's one of our brands that is doing really well. One thing we do different than other companies is every system that's ordered, we donate to help um, the millions of children who don't have access to dental care. Um, it's, it's baked into our business. So as kind of a, instead of an after the fact, we built everything we do, we try to bake some social element into the business itself. And um, 
and, and so that's important. And then uh, we've got a few other brands. We've got 4 million followers on social media, uh, health and fitness. So I lost 100 plus pounds. And in that process, tried every protein powder, every fat burner, I've tried them all. And realizing kind of what works, what doesn't, um, to what extent. And so we have a, a few health and uh, fitness brands um, that, are, that are dominating social media. What kind of products? So we sell um, uh, uh, protein powder, pre-workouts, um, uh, uh, brain and cognitive supplements, okay. everything organic, all natural, the highest quality stuff. And again, our sweet spot is in the premium uh, because if we are able to charge a little bit more than everybody, we can put more into our product. And when I think about 30 years out, what I want to be known for, um, it's not necessarily having the cheapest products, it's about having the best products. And in order to do that, you have to really put quality for, uh, first, which means your design, your marketing, all of that needs to be on point because people aren't gonna shell out $67 for some protein powder if it's not truly the best thing they've ever had. Do you always try to pick products, or it seems like it's a theme with you, that you always go high end on the pricing and the product delivery? Is that kind of your angle? I try to because, um, Especially, I think, I think if I were, we're, we have no debt in our business, no outside funding, no bank loans, nothing. So because of that, that discipline, uh, I can't help myself, but remember my starting days when I had $100 and I had to make 150 back. When you're operating a business that way, you have to have margins baked into your business so that you can fuel your own growth. So it's important on that aspect, but you also have to make sure that you're not overcharging the consumer and you're actually giving them something that's that's truly superior than your competitors. It has to be, you have to, the packaging even, the, the boxes that we use, the, the glass that we use, um, all of that is so, so important down to where we source our ingredients, how we market, how we angle, everything needs to be in line because if you go to Louis Vuitton and you buy a $2,500 briefcase and it falls apart the next week, um, you're, you lost that customer forever. And so people will spend money like Patagonia, they have a lifetime, uh, warranty on their products. You know, anything breaks, bring it in, we'll take care of you. That's the type of business I realized I wanted to build. And unless you're raising a lot of money or you have the ability, the volume game, it's very hard to play at the bottom of the field, racing to the bottom. The middle gets squeezed because it's hard to differentiate. And the premium, there's a certain little spot there where the premium does really well. Um, and then ultra premium can do well as, as well, selling yachts but then you're in the, the high service, high, high element. So for me, it was important to be scalable, so have the volume, have the margins so we could self-fund our growth, but also build a respectable brand that could be around 50 years from now, where people say, yeah, it seems a little bit pricier, but trust me, it's worth it. It's worth it. And I look at brands like Dyson, uh, Vitamix, I look at brands that have the, the staying power where you know they're pricey, but it's kind of an honor, it's like a, a, a tradition or a mark when you're able to purchase that product. And for us, our teeth whitening system right now um, sells for $150, so it's, it's about two to three times the price of, of white strips or something else, but it's still a lot cheaper than the dental procedure, but you get better results at home. Um, and then uh, it's cheaper than veneers, which are $1,000, $2,000 a tooth. So you still have that value aspect, but the way you're positioning it is, is, is in a different way. You're not going against the low cost competitors. Right. And that's what Floyd Mayweather and a lot of our celebrity uh, partners recognize in our branding is that they want to associate. They know nowadays influencer marketing has become pretty mainstream. So whatever they're pitching on their social media, they want to make sure it's on brand. And celebrities um, have the luxury and the budget to choose great products. And so we want to make sure that we're creating something that celebrities are proud to talk about, share, promote, and that they would use themselves. On, on, a, on a more granular level, right? Because it's already at this crazy place where you got Floyd Mayweather type influencer deals. Um, from a more granular level, right? In, in, a, in a, the current climate, and I think a lot of people that are going to be in Barcelona, they're into e-commerce on the drop shipping side where they want to switch into brand and myself included when I start to look at brand as opposed to drop shipping there's still the product selection at the very beginning right how do you go and make this decision or how do you pick a product knowing you're gonna go in so deep on investing into it or believing it or do you test a lot of 
product before you picked your winner and, and dug in on teeth whitening? Like, how does that work for you? How do you select? Well, I think that business is, business is very difficult. And uh, the bigger you get, the challenges don't go away. They only magnify. Um, and hopefully you build uh, a team of A players that can help you overcome those challenges. But um, for me, I realized with teeth whitening, for example, and oral care, I've had, um, I've had jaw surgery. I had jaw surgery last year. Uh, they took out my jaw. It was a, it was a whole procedure. Braces multiple times. Um, just continually for the last 15 years of my life, I've been dealing with my teeth. So that meant that I was constantly down the oral care aisle in, in drugstores, CVS, Walgreens, Rite Aid. And um, I, I tried every product. So as I started to make more and more money personally, my pickiness went up. So now I was like, I don't want just regular floss. I want the best floss. Where do I find that? And I think you start to realize that. I think Jessica Alba realized that as well. Being a successful um, uh, actor, entrepreneur, she, having, having a child, she wanted the very best for her child and realized that the market wasn't really catering to that, saw a big gap and created a billion dollar honest company. For me, it was a similar process where I had tried every whitening procedure, dentist, white strips, everything, and was never truly like wowed. I was never amazed by the technology. I always felt it was low tech. Um, and there was really no innovation happening there for 20 years. So for me, a personal tie is important. And this could, this could mean anything. If you like hunting, if you like eating, whatever it is, if you have a personal tie to it, you will remain interested. You will think deeper than your competitors will and you'll be able to play in those edges of the business, which is where we make all of our money. The edges of the business are really where, um, not just thinking outside of the box, but thinking in other boxes and how the boxes connect. And you can't do that if you really don't like something. Right. Um, now, we, we're in the cosmetics, skincare, uh, beauty, health and fitness. These are all areas that um, I'm very interested in. I've always have been. Uh, I like beautiful design. I like premium products and creating that experience. When someone receives our product, it should be an experience when they're opening it, they're reading through, even the copy that's, that's on the instruction manual should make them feel good. Um, and so for me, I look, I look at products, the things that I would want to use, things that uh, my close family may want to use, and where there's a need. So I'm not creating, I'm never creating something where it's, it's creating a brand new need. People want protein powder, they're already buying it, but they're willing to spend a little bit more for something better, great because unless you have a huge budget or I'm just not smart enough to invent something completely out of left field that you want to piggyback off of an existing large market. My thinking is if, if I could own 10% of the market, that should be a billion dollar company. And so it's got to be a bigger market. So it's got to be, let's say hair care, or it can be technology, drones. There's so many out there. Think about things that you buy that you haven't returned, things that you like, or things that you did return and say, I would do this differently. And what we usually do is we start off by um, either drop shipping, private label, start really low cost, and then see if there's traction there. If there's traction, you're like, wow, this stuff is selling, and it's not even nowhere near where I know it could be. Then you start talking to manufacturers, reinvesting your profits and saying, hey, make the brush instead of a metal base, aluminum, so it's lighter. Start improving and start on improving. it and making your own. You make your so own. So it, 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 they've been banned, excuse me, it seems like a lot of them have just been born out of like a pain point, market gap, but something that you really knew the product, like it sounds like you're designing the product for yourself. Yeah. And that's why it, it, it comes off for you. Is that kind of accurate? Yeah, it's, it's also, so, so one of the things we do is we scrape, um, we examine all the Amazon reviews, jet.com, walmart.com. We create a cluster map of all the keywords, and then we can see immediately in five seconds, what are the top complaints?